If you want to be turning in your Bibles, you can go ahead and begin to turn to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at the second half of Daniel chapter 7 today, uh, thinking about, I can only imagine, thinking about when we all get to heaven, uh, and, and the title of the message is, Some Things Do Last Forever. You know, you, you've heard people say, don't worry, it doesn't last forever. Nothing lasts forever. Some things do. And we need to think about that as followers of Christ. As a matter of fact, the, the fact that eternity is just that, it is eternity, it lasts forever, should be a motivating factor on several fronts for us as Christians. It should be a motivating factor for us to live our daily life, to understand that no matter what we go through on this earth, it doesn't last forever. That whether we live to be 35 or 105, there comes a day when this life as we know it will be over. But the next life, the life that continues, is the life of eternity. It's a life of, according to Scripture, of eternal joy or, or eternal torment. And, and, and we don't like to talk about that. You know, we live in a politically correct world now where everything's supposed to be peaches and roses and nobody loses and everybody gets a participation trophy. Which, by the way, is killing our society. Because we've got a bunch of middle-aged and a little bit younger brats who, and I'm one of them, who don't know how to lose and if they don't get their way, they pitch a fit and scream and cry. And it's where we are, isn't it? Read the paper. Watch the news. In life, there are winners and losers. Not, not, in, not, in, not in the negative way that you're thinking about it, but somebody gets the job, somebody doesn't. Not everybody gets a paycheck, right? Well, in our society, just about everybody does anymore. And I, wherever you stand politically, that, that, it's not our, you know, look, the church, we're supposed to take care of our own. We're supposed to do that, those kind of things, and we are supposed to look out for other people. But the Bible says we're also supposed to work diligently and labor. James says, in relation to our faith, not just in a political or a socioeconomic realm, James also says, you show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. You see, we live in a society also, too, where people think if you punch your ticket at the church membership desk and got dunked in some water that you're headed for heaven. Scripture doesn't teach that. Matter of fact, Paul talks over and over and over and over and over again that it is those who endure unto the end that will be saved. Now, we're not saved because of our endurance, but our endurance shows evidence that we are truly born again. And the Bible says to Jesus taught about judging our fruit, being fruit inspectors. How often do you look in the mirror and judge your own fruit? I can judge mine based against somebody else's and I can look really good. I can judge it based against someone else and look really bad. <laughs> but I'm not to compare myself to any of them. I'm to compare myself to the person of Christ and the work of Christ and his example that he set for me when he was on earth. And I know we're, 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 we're not exactly talking about those things, but we are talking about those things today because eternity is eternity. Some things do last forever. And just like Daniel, he's in the middle of this vision, he's in the middle of this dream, and he sees the, the beast come up out of the sea in the first uh, 14 verses as we looked at last week, and then he sees the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days, coming on the clouds. It's a, a beautiful dichotomy of the war that's going on in, 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 our, in the spiritual realm of what's happening all around us and the war for souls, the war for men and women, the war for the minds of our young people. And as we get to the passage we're in today, just like Daniel, it's kind of refreshing, honestly. When I look at where Daniel's at, when he's just seen this glorious vision of the Son of Man coming in the clouds and setting up a dominion, but if we get to verse 15, I'm refreshed by seeing the honesty of Daniel. And I don't know about you, but there's occasionally, I know the end, and I know what the Lord's planning to do, and I know because I've read the entirety of the book, but I want to tell you, there are times when my heart is distressed. There are times when I look around and wonder, God, how long? God, what are you doing? God, when? God, why? 
All those questions, if they don't, if you've never thought about those things, you haven't looked at our world very much lately. And in Daniel chapter 15, chapter 7, excuse me, Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 15, we read the rest of the story. We read as Daniel continues to ask and seek for wisdom as he goes through this dream. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read a few of these verses today. And we think about some things do last forever. Excuse me, I'll try not to do that too much. Daniel chapter 7, verse 15 says, Daniel says, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me. And the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all of this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts which are four in number are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. For all ages to come. Father, thank you for your word. Teach us this morning. Challenge us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I just wanted to share those few word, verses because the, the latter part is a little bit of an interpretation, and we'll get to that in just a moment, of that fourth beast and then kind of a re repetition at the end. But, you know, I, I want you to understand, and one of the things that's refreshing about Scripture and I love about the Bible is it doesn't hide things, even from its great characters, even from its great men of faith and women of faith. It doesn't hide their flaws. And even though Daniel has seen this great vision and he's, he really is beginning to understand it, he's still a little bit anxious. He's still a little bit uh, not understanding. He, he remembers the interpretation of the dream. I'm sure he recalls back when he shared that dream of the great statue with Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure he's piecing the two, the two together and he's seeing the parallel there but that fourth beast has him perplexed. That fourth beast that is so destructive and so, uh, so uh, angry and, and so harsh has him struggling. I don't know about you, but I have those same struggles sometimes. As I said a moment ago, I know what the scriptures teach. I know about the end. I know we have all kinds of discussions and you know, we have different viewpoints on when the, it, will the church go through the tribulation? Will it not go through the tribulation? How much of this will we see before the, the Lord takes us out or will he take us out? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I still wrestle all those questions myself. And the more I read scripture, the more sometimes I, I, I'm not sure, to be quite honest with you. But I do know this. I know I serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. And whether I'm raptured out before or whether I'm... Uh, upheld and I'm protected through it, I know that my God reigns. I know that my Lord is sovereign and I know that he will take care of me. And that's what Daniel's dealing with. He's not dealing with wondering if God can do it. I mean, we, we've seen that in his life, right? He's not concerned if God can handle the situation. But in our humanity, we wonder how much are we going to have to go through? How much are we going to have to suffer? You know, we live in America, We've shared this many times before. We don't think we should have to suffer. I mean, around the world, there's no problem. Post-tribulational rapture in 90% of the countries around the world is not a big deal because they're thinking, how much worse could it get? There's you know, hundreds of thousands of people dying every year. More people have been martyred in the last 15 to 20 years for the cause of Christ than, than have been up to that point combined. I mean, it's crazy. We, we don't think about it anymore. We read the scripture. We think, oh, all that stuff's in the past because we don't see it. We don't live it. Talk to missionaries who have been over serving in some of these hostile territories. They'll tell you they've watched their friends. They've watched their family members be executed, be tortured and tormented. And those kind of things, as, as Daniel is seeing this in this vision, he's seeing this fourth beast, he's perplexed. His spirit, it says, is alarmed as he continues to think about it, even though he understands and knows that God is sovereign, he understands and knows that God is control, he asked the question in verse 15, my spirit was distressed, and he went up to one of those who was there. And he says, what is the meaning of all of this? What is the understanding? Verse 16 says, I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. See, here's the great thing. 
God is a God of answers. God is not a God who wants to keep you in the dark. You know, I, I, this is a side note, and I'm not, I promise I'm not going to chase more than eight or nine rabbits today. Um, but uh, <laughs> what was it? Was it who was it? Was um, somebody said? I heard him say, "said You know, chasing rabbits not a bad thing as long as you catch it." Um, but uh, anyway, I'm not sure I catch all mine. Um, where was I going? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, it's tough some days. There you go. God's a God of answers. Thank you. And God teaches us, and he holds us in those moments. And when we go to him with questions, he's not hiding. One of the big things we deal with is, I hear people all the time, well, I, I just don't know what the will of God is. Why? He's not playing hide and seek with it. He wants you to know. You know, when we, you know and, and I'm going to tell you from my life, I'm not going to talk about y'all, I'm going to talk about me, okay? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings this morning. So I'll talk about me. You know what I have found out when I don't know what the will of God is for my life? It's not that I don't know what the will of God is for my life. It's that I don't like the will of God for my life. And when I say I'm looking for the will of God, really I'm looking for a different will. <laughs> I'm looking for something I like better. I'm looking for something that, I, that I, I want to do, not that he wants me to do. And that's usually where it, where it boils down to when we come to that. So, so our heart gets distressed because we see things we may not understand. We see things we may not know. And Daniel was at this point. His spirit was deeply distressed. He was anxious. He was alarmed. So he approached one, probably an angel, standing by in his vision. And he said, please make known to me what's going on here. And in verse 17, it says, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. Now, so he starts here, but he, but he, but he jumps real quickly. He says, first of all, I'm sure Daniel probably was like, duh, huh? I, I kind of figured that one out. But, but, Dan, but then the angel jumps right to reassure Daniel because I'm sure he probably sees on his face and he sees, and this is what God does for us, and he wants to remind us that his people, Daniel being one of those, us being one of those, we've given our life to him, are a people who are going to receive an eternal kingdom. This world is not the end. The beautiful thing for the Christian is this is as bad as it will ever get. And what the, the angel, I believe, is trying to share with Daniel is just that statement, is just that story, is we can be encouraged today, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad the circumstance is, no matter how deep the depression, no matter how sick the illness, no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter how deep the hurt, this is as bad as it will ever get. And the angel looks at Daniel in verse 18 and he says, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, for all ages to come. You see, we share in what the Ancient of Days has given to the Son of Man. A moment ago, last week when we talked about Back in those early verses when the Son of Man approached and, and, and God gave him dominion and told him to go and take dominion, that one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, we are heirs with him. Sinclair Ferguson, a Scotsman and theologian, made the statement, the one like the Son of Man is related in some special way to the saints of the Most High, so that they share in his dominion. We share in his dominion. You see, one like the Son of Man had to appear to be all that Adam failed to be. You know, that's when the Old Testament talks about a new Adam. Paul refers to Jesus as the new Adam. Paul expounds on this in Romans and 1 Corinthians. You see, it was through, in and through Adam's fall, excuse me, it was in and through Adam's fall that sin and death came to all who followed. The reason we struggle, the reason we deal with what we deal with today is because all of creation was touched when sin entered the world. Not one portion of anything or anyone wasn't touched when sin entered the world. The Bible says that the earth groans, awaiting its redemption. The ground even quakes. The, everything cries out, awaiting God to restore it back to what it was intended to be. Waiting for God to come, and, and, and through that, uh, one like the Son of Man had to come and set things straight. His conquest means that all those who belong to him share in his victory. Hebrews chapter 2 looks at this very in, intensely and in depth. In Hebrews 2, 9, as a matter of fact, we see, it says, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus, when he went to that cross, what we're going into that season where we celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, when he went to that cross, he did it for one reason. He didn't do it to make a spectacle. He did it to take on the sin of the world. Those things that you and I deserve punishment for, Jesus took on the cross. Jesus took all of that weight. He, he took the Father's rejection. He took all of the Father's wrath that you and I couldn't handle. He took it upon himself. Why? So that he could set aright what Adam and what we have destroyed. This earth was created to last forever. You and I were created, Adam and Eve were created to last for eternity. But because sin entered the world, death entered the world. And the great deception of Satan is the same deception he deceives us with today. Oh, not now. Oh, he doesn't mean right now. He doesn't mean right away. You see, and that's, the, that's the deception we fall for. I think one of the greatest sins in the world is procrastination, especially for the believer. You know, when the Spirit moves on you to go talk to that person about Jesus, and you say, next time. Not right now. I don't want to bother them. When the Spirit moves on you to pray for someone, and, oh, but I'm busy, or I'm asleep. <laughs> don't wake me up. All those things, in the, and Satan says, oh, you don't need to do it right now. Just do it later. One of the greatest stall tactics for the Christian in the world is the words, I'll pray for you. You know what I mean by that? When somebody comes up to you and shares a burden, I'll pray for you. Why not pray right then? Why not just stop? Well, well we're in the mall. Somebody might see us. We're at the gas station. We're at Walmart. Somebody might see us. We're at school. I, you know, separation of church and state. Can't have that in there. <laughs> Whatever. Pray. Somebody comes up to you, a classmate or a, 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 a co-teacher, a co-worker, whatever it might be, and i got to quit putting stuff on the, bull, on the pulpit. Whoever it might be, if they share a burden on their heart, why not stop right there? You don't have to pray for 45 minutes, but pray for them. Because I know we don't do it intentionally. I'm, I'll pray for you, and three days later we think about it again. Maybe. Or the next time we see them, three months from now, we think about it again. Why? Because that's Satan's tactic. Because he knows when Christians are praying, when Christians are uh, holding one another accountable, when, when Christians are loving on one another and encouraging one another, he is defeated. And we forget that eternity is in view here. We have already won. Why do we live life like we're defeated? Yes, it's tough. Yes, it's difficult. Read Daniel's biography. We just did for six chapters. He served the Lord and he got thrown in the lion's den. His friends served the Lord and he got thrown in a fiery furnace. He, Joseph served the Lord and he got thrown into jail over and over and over again. So why is it that we think we should be any different? We just pray some prayers, throw some money in the plate, and God's gonna, we're going to sail to heaven. <laughs> Whew. That sounds good for TV. That's good for ratings but it's bad for pews. You know why? Because there's a lot of people in this society who we've sold them, that bill of goods. They get saved, they give their life to Jesus, they pray a prayer, and all of a sudden they go out and start telling people they love, that they've, they've given their life to Jesus, and they're like, whoa, back off, religious nut. Why would you do that? That's just stupid. That's ignorant. That's a crutch for ignorant people. And they say, time out. That's not what I signed up for. Everybody's supposed to love me and throw warm fuzzies at me and, and, and all... No, why? Because our eternity is not here. Our eternity is with him. Jesus told us they hated him, that they would hate us too if we live for him. I'm not trying to be a downer today. I'm just trying to tell you reality. And, and that's why our heart gets distressed. That's why, because we long for this eternity. We long for this peace. We long for this thing. And Jesus says, I will be with you and I will be your peace while you're on earth. And one day I will bring you to glory. I'm going away to prepare a place for you so that I can come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you will be also. He doesn't leave us alone to go through the troubles. He walks with us in them. 
But our eternity, even though it's already set in our heart, that's why we feel so at odds with this world. You're not abnormal if you feel at odds with the world. As a matter of fact, as a Christian, if you feel at odds with the world, you're probably more normal than abnormal. Because this is not our final place. The coronation of that one, the, like the Son of Man, is the assurance that those who belong to him are going to join him in his dominion. And I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit because the angel goes on in the next few verses, verses 19 through 26, and explains what's going to happen next. You see, there's an eternity that awaits us. There's an eternal kingdom that we're going to be a part of, but it's not yet. You see, that's the tension that we live in. We live in the tension of the already not yet. We already know we've received it. We already know we have it. It's already ours, but we haven't actually attained it yet. And in verse 19, the angel goes on to describe to Daniel. It says, then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. So we see what was really perplexing Daniel, right? He wants to know exactly what's going on with that fourth beast. That one that was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron, its claws of bronze, in which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder of, with its feet. Verse 20 says, And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and the horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, verse 23, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the 10 horns out of, his, out of this kingdom, 10 kings will arise and another will arise after them and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law and they will be given into his hand for a time, times and a half a time. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. <coughs> The beauty of this passage is this. Yes, it's a little distressing, isn't it? Because if you look there in the middle of those passages of Scripture, you see where there's going to come a time where this horn, this person, is going to win. This Antichrist uh, is going to, to win. He's going he's to bring war against the saints. He's going to prevail, it says there in those verses. But it's only for a short time. It's only for a short while. This little horn is warring against God's holy ones. And as we said there, as we see also in Revelation 13, 7, as we see here, he is winning in verse 21. He's overpowering them. And then verse 23 through 26 describe this fourth beast who is also the final beast. He is Rome and, and more than Rome. And we see that again in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. Many times in Scripture you have an immediate context and you have a future context. I believe Daniel is talking about the Roman Empire without a doubt, but I believe it also is, is talking about that future kingdom that's going to be established, some sort of a continuation of the Roman Empire that's going to uh, rear its ugly head again in Revelation 13 and is going to devour and trample and crush. It's going to rise and subdue. He's going to speak out against the Most High, wear out the saints. <laughs> Sometimes we wonder, how could we be wore out anymore? But this is a difficult time, and it says he's going to do it for a time and time and half a time. What exactly all those times mean, uh, we don't have time to delve into all that today for the study that we're doing right now. But I want to assure you that this is the Old Testament Connecting with the New Testament in Revelation, it's Daniel foreseeing what John would be given. He's seeing the same thing. And if you lay these two books, these last six chapters, over several of those chapters there in Revelation, you'll see direct parallels, direct correlations as to what's going to happen at the end of time and how difficult it may be. 
Some of the specifics of this vision, like visions in Revelation, will remain a mystery. They're meant to be mysterious. We're not meant to know everything there is to know about apocalyptic literature. They're signs, they're wonders, and this, this, this ten, these ten horns that grew out of this beast, this, uh, these, these things that it represents, uh, the Roman Empire, and then a, a great and mighty and powerful leader, this little horn, basically represents the final consummation of what evil is going to be. This final attack on the Lord, this final uh, thrust of, uh, of Satan and his, uh, in, in his, his dominions to overthrow the Father. What he's been trying to do for his entire existence, to overcome and to beat down. This little horn emerges in the context of this beast with the ten horns. And Daniel talks a lot about this antichrist, or, or he doesn't really call him that at the time. We see the correlation with Revelation, this same kind of horn uh, person, creature, speaking great things. But, but not just the antichrist, but there have been antichrists throughout history. There have been people, anybody who is opposed to Christ is an anti. Christ. I mean, we, we could, so we could look at that. There's been several, and, and no matter how many may come, there have been leaders and world leaders throughout history who have come to try to thwart the things of God, to try to beat down the things of God. You have Nero's, you have the Hitler's of the world, and no matter how many of them come, they all fail. They all fail in the eyes of God. The Antichrist, they blaspheme God. They persecute God's people. They're lawbreakers. They're disruptors of God's good design. They do everything they can to beat us down, to beat the church down, to destroy the things of God, and to make the church go away. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do. And he got changed by it. Because you see, the world wants to discredit but what the world can't discredit is truth. Because truth is truth. You ever met somebody who is a, a kind of a, a pathological liar? You ever met somebody who lies all the time? You know they do, and, and, uh, but they think, they're t they, they think they've got you fooled. And every time you talk to them, it's a different story. You know, you hear... People can lie long enough to where they'll even begin to believe it's true. Well, see, that's what Satan does. Satan, he, he just spouts lies. He's the father of lies. And he, he wants to constantly tell lies about God. It's what he did to Eve in the garden. It's what he does to us today. He says, oh, God didn't really care about you. But truth always stands. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest things that we can do in our lives, one of the things I try to tell my children, one of the things I've tried to, I try to live out in my life, sometimes truth's hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to tell the truth. Sometimes it's easier to skirt it a little bit or, 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 or you know, flower it up a little bit. But ultimately, the truth's going to come out. And, and when, you, when you flower it up a little bit, and then the truth really does hit, it's even harder, isn't it? Many times. And Satan wants to lie to us and wants to tell us. And, and churches, if we're not careful, we try to lie. And we, in order to draw numbers, in order to get people to show up and get crowds, you know, we'll, we'll entertain. We'll do all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and we'll try. But listen, the Bible's about truth. Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth. And he tells us over and over again how the truth is what it is that will set us free. When you're honest and truthful, even though it may be hard for you, even though it may be hard for those you love, when we speak truth, it is liberating. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to fear. Truth always triumphs. The angel shared with Daniel, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be trouble. It's going to appear the saints are losing. <clears throat> but verse 26 says, But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Verse 27, Then the sovereignty the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And at this point, the revelation ended 
As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. You see, we're given an eternal kingdom. It's going to last forever. But we're going to suffer for a while under the dominion of this world. But then the angel reminds Daniel again at the end and brings to a, a consummation that we're going to have a universal kingdom. It's going to last forever. It's not just eternal, it's universal. It's going to encompass everything. There's not a part that won't be redeemed. The Bible says in Revelation that John saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first earth had passed away. This world has become so corrupt that God's going to have to destroy it with a fervent heat so he can recreate what he intended for his people. He's going to destroy that great deceiver forever, the God most high. We'll see to it. We said a moment ago, all these lunatics like Hitler and Nero and others who have tried to destroy the people of God and the things of God. They're going to have their reign for a season. But God's going to have his kingdom for eternity. An everlasting kingdom. All rulers, it says in verse 27, will serve and obey him. They will obey the Son of Man. This is the good news. This is the end of the matter. This is, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. You see, I don't know how bad your situation looks today. I don't know what you're struggling with today. I, I know I, I hear people every week who are dealing with bad health diagnoses. I hear people all the time who are struggling with family matters. People who are struggling with financial matters. And on and on and on. But we must be reminded this is not the end. And whatever you're struggling with today, I know it's real. I've walked some of those paths. Many of you have walked some of those paths. Maybe you're on the other side of it now. But the Bible teaches us over and over again, in this world you will have tribulation. But Jesus said, do not fear because I am with you. I will never leave you. I will walk through the fire with you. I will. He told the nation of Israel in Isaiah 43 that the rivers would not overwhelm them and the fire would not burn them, but he would be there with them. What are you struggling with today? What are you trying to carry on your own? What load is it? What burden is it that you're trying to figure out on your own? Jesus is saying, come to me. Cast all your cares on me. Listen, if he can take the sin of the world on a cross, he can take my worries. He can take my cares. He can take the things that, that weigh me down every day, and he can do so much more with them than I could ever imagine. Won't you just give them to him? Won't you just release them to him? And then won't you make a commitment to him about that verse that we read earlier, right at offering time, that Jesus said, when my spirit comes upon you, which, by the way, happens when you receive him as your Lord and Savior, when my spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses. When that person shares a burden, would you stop and pray with them right there? When you see that person struggling in the grocery store line or at work and you know they don't have a church home, when you know they don't have any, maybe you don't have anybody to go to and you just see a distressed look on their face, would you just approach them and say, how can I pray for you? I just, you seem burdened. How can I pray? That's a way to witness. Can you invite somebody to come with you on Easter Sunday morning? Would you take some of those little true life cards that we have in the back and over the next three weeks leading up to Easter Sunday morning, just say, hey, I would, I would love it if you'd, you'd join me on Easter Sunday morning. I promise you my pastor's not going to beat you up because you only show up on Easter. I won't. I promise you that. I won't embarrass you that way. 
and then challenge them to watch some of those videos, to answer some of their questions. Look, I know people have questions. And you know what? We've got answers <laughs> right there. To every question of life, there's an answer. It doesn't come from my wit or my great intellect or yours either. It comes from the truth of the word of God. When we stick to it, we'll be on the right side. There's coming a day when his joy will never end, when we will be with him and we will see him just as he is. The question is, have you made your reservation? Are you living your life for him? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? And are you allowing him to rule and reign in your life? to give you joy and peace for eternity. He can give it to you now in the midst of your trial and struggle, but he'll ultimately give it to you for eternity when we go to be with him.